Hello, everyone. In this lesson, I'm going to tell you about the thing that really put Einstein's name on the map, and that is the photoelectric effect. Okay, so the story so far in this uh, very short unit is that um, we had these two historical models of light proposed. One was proposed by Newton, and that was the particle model. So, he, so Newton thought that light was made up of particles. Huygens was looking more uh, at the similarities between light and water and light and sound. And so Huygens thought that light was made of waves. And because Newton was the, was the um, had more fame, I suppose, right? He had a larger following. Uh, Newton's model was the one that was accepted for several hundred years. So for several hundred years, everyone within science uh, was using a wave model. Oh, excuse me, was using a particle model. I apologize. However, uh, things changed in, uh, in 18, 1801, I think that's right, um, when Thomas Young performed the two -slit, his two-slit experiment, and he made observations which simply could not be explained with the particle model. Namely, he saw that when light was passed through two slits, the light would interfere with each other, and you would get this fringe pattern, and that was what you observed in your, um, in your simulation last week. And so Young basically said, look, if, we, if we're going to have this interference occurring, then the only way that that makes sense is if uh, light is a wave. So this really upset the apple cart and really started to, um, you know, sink Newton's stock, at least as far as the wave model, as far as his particle model of light was concerned. So things kind of shifted back the other way. So again, for about 100 years after Young, this wave model started coming back into um, started coming back into popularity, and that's kind of where things were. Um, and so the particle model was largely abandoned. Now, again, remember this is this is how science works, right? We basically have a theory. So in this case, where we have we have some theory which explains um, how light behaves. Um, but as soon as there are observations which the theory cannot explain, then at the very least the theory has to be amended uh, or you know, new features have to be added. Or in really dire circumstances, the theory is completely abandoned and uh, you have to come up with a new theory. So that's basically what was happening here. And then things changed again because, you know, one thing, if, if one thing is constant, it's that change always happens. So there's Newton. He's crying. <laughs> All right, anyway. So that brings us to this thing called the photoelectric effect, which was first observed in about 1887 by the German physicist Heinrich Rudolf Hertz. So if you're, in case you're wondering, yes, that is where the units Hertz get their name from. Um, and so in this case, um, or at this time, rather, Hertz was studying radio waves because this was a kind of emerging technology. And in particular, one of the things he was working with was a pair of metal electrodes, right, parallel plates. And he was really interested in figuring out what voltage it was where the, there would be sparking occurring between the plates because sparking is generally something you want to avoid. And so he was just trying to figure out, okay, well, how much voltage do I need in order to have sparking occur? Uh, so in this case, he was using these parallel plates. Uh, I don't know exactly what he was using them for, but probably to create some kind of constant electric field. And whenever you have sparking or arcing, then um, you're going to at least potentially damage your equipment, or you could start a fire in a really serious case. So he was very concerned with this from a practical standpoint and want to avoid this. And what he observed was that when there was ultraviolet light, shining on the electrodes, then all of a sudden the voltage that it was required to, um, to uh, uh, have sparking occur would drop, right? It, re it would require less voltage. And um, he, was, he was interested in like, why, what's going on here? Um, and he didn't really have an explanation. So he just basically made some, made some observations um, and hoped that at some point a more, uh, you know, a robust, um, theory would come along. And this is quite often the way it goes in science, right? You may have some experimentalist, in this case Hertz, who um, is working on a problem, see something that, uh, see something that, that they can't explain, and really all their job at that point is to just document this strange thing, 
and uh, hope that at some point, um, you know, perhaps a theoretical physicist will come up with uh, an explanation. So the key though, the key thing that Hertz observed was that this ultraviolet light, for some reason, again, he wasn't sure why, but for some reason it was liberating electrons from the metal electrodes, right? So, so there was a electric field and for some reason shining the light on, on the plate would pull electrons out of the electrode and he didn't know what was going on there. And especially he didn't, I mean, you can imagine that Hertz probably knew, um, uh, you know, the, the, the current theories, uh, specifically the accepted theory of the wave model. And the wave model doesn't really explain what's going on here. Um, so I'm going to try and explain what, you know, kind of what you might think of uh, the wave model, like how, how you might try and explain this with a wave model and where that kind of falls apart. Right? So again, this is, this is something typical. If you have a theory that, that does explain some observations, then you don't just want to throw it away immediately. You want to see, okay, well, what does the theory say? And, you know, then if it still doesn't explain this new, these new observations, then that's where you have to look to amend or replace it. Okay, so before I do that, though, before I d d explain the analogy, I just want to show kind of what uh, what Hertz was observing, uh, and I'm going to use one of these uh, FET simulations. Um, this one runs on Java, though, so uh, unfortunately you can't run it so easily in your browser, but for those of you who have computers with Java on them, then you will be able to play with this yourself, so that will actually be part of uh, this week's work, although it is optional, right? It's not, it's not required. Okay, so here's a very simple um, model of, actually, it's, it's a little bit more than, than what um, Hertz was probably working with, but nevertheless, it captures the important points. So here are the two plates that are, um, that, that are separated, and in this case, they're in a vacuum. Now, it's possible that Hertz was working with vacuum tubes, um, although actually, I don't know. Right. If he's doing radio waves, that, that would make sense. So it's entirely possible that he had some kind of a vacuum tube with two metal plates um, um, within the vacuum tube separated by some distance. And what we've done here, or what's, what, what's happening in the simulation, is the two plates are connected by a wire to a battery. Okay, So this is, this is simply there so that if we want to, we can, um, we can adjust the electric field that exists between the plates, right? By by adjusting the, the voltage, so that's fine. Um, the other thing that we have here is we have an ammeter, which is going to tell us uh, if we have a current. So right now you can see the ammeter is reading zero current because after all, these two plates, uh, although they are connected to a battery, these two plates do not make a, a complete circuit, so the current can't flow. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to turn on. Oh, and by the way, sorry. the the one The one other thing here is that the the plates have to be made out of, um, of. We can we can choose a bunch of different metals for our for our target plate, right? The one that the light is going to shine on. Right now, it's sodium. Uh, we also can choose zinc, copper, platinum, calcium, and some unknown. Well, I'm not I'm not going to do that, but anyway, we just stick with sodium. Sodium, it turns out, is because it's a group. Is it group two? Um, it's quite easy to remove an electron from sodium, so. Uh, we can uh, we can see we can kind of see what's going on here. So this one uh, right now the light is set to uh, ultraviolet, right? So we're going to be just like Hertz did. We're going to be shining ultraviolet light on this sodium, and we're going to see what happens. How do I do this? Uh, no. Oh, okay, right. I have to turn up the intensity, and that would help. Okay, so there you go. So I turned up the intensity to sixteen percent. And all of a sudden, I started getting these ejected electrons. And these electro ejected electrons have some kinetic energy, but more importantly, they're just going to uh, fly over here to the um, to the positive plate. And I can read the current. Right, this is in amps. It's actually quite low. So what I can do is, for example, I can increase the intensity of the light, make the light brighter, and I put it at 50%, and kind of what you would expect, I would see I have a lot more ejected photoelectrons, right? These are called photoelectrons, and they're flying over, and the current goes up. I can crank this all the way up to 100%, and now I get tons of photoelectrons, and my current is what it is. 
All righty. Let me dial that back down again. Okay, so just, just kind of where we started seeing stuff. 15% uh, should be fine. All right, so right now I've got the UV light, okay? And I've got this current of 0 0.02. Actually, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that back. Sorry. We're going to keep it at high intensity, okay? So we've got maximum intensity, maximum brightness. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the, the wavelength of the light, right? This is the wavelength. 400 nanometers is ultraviolet. I'm going to go into the blue spectrum. So I have about 450 nanometers thereabouts. Okay. And did you see what happened to the current? Let's go back. Oops. Whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll just go. There we go. Okay. So I started. So in the ultraviolet, I have about 0 .0, 0 0.15 uh, amps for my current. Okay. Fine. But then if I go into the blue, my current drops, okay? Meaning that I'm not getting as many photoelectrons or at the very least, the photoelectrons are not ejected with the same kinetic energy. Okay, two possibilities there. If I uh, further change the wavelength and go into the green, now all of a sudden, if I go to let's say 500 nanometers, isn't quite so easy to dial, but there you go. 500 nanometers, 502. Then my current drops to nothing. So despite the fact that I'm shining very into, where are, they, where are these photoelectrons going? From? Okay, I guess there are a few, but it's just so few to, that doesn't register. So despite the fact that my green light is very high intensity, my uh, I'm I'm not getting as nearly as much uh, in terms of a, of a current here. Okay, the the reading is zero, even though it actually shows some of them coming out. If I go even further, let's say I go into the red here. Okay, there you go, actually it's kind of orange. 700 nanometers is usually what I think of as red. Good enough. Then in this case, you can see that the ejected photoelectrons, well, there aren't any at all. So there's two things going on here, right? Two, two switches that essentially I can change. I can change the intensity and I can change the wavelength of the light. And both of them seem to have an effect, although um, there's well, we'll talk about the two the two different effects. But I just wanna I just want you to 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 observe those two different things. Um, for those of you who want to play around with this uh, on your own, uh, things to try. I'm not gonna do it here, but things to try is uh, definitely change the change the target right to these different metals, for example. Uh, they're pretty interesting, and um, you can also. Uh, oh, maybe I should have shown this one. Show only highest. Oh, that's fine. You can also play with different graphs. So you can see, for example, how does the current change with light intensity? How does current change with battery voltage? I didn't even play around with the battery voltage here. And how does the uh, electron energy change with light frequency? This last one is actually the most interesting. And it's the one that, um, that uh, Einstein ultimately got his Nobel Prize for. So that's the one that I'm going to continue on with. Uh, in the notes today. Okay, so let me try and explain what we were observing uh, the way it might have been so the way it might have been explained with the wave model. So really I'm just going to be using uh, an analogy of an apple tree. So I want you to imagine that the that the apple tree is the metal plate and it and the apple tree is full of apples, which in this case represent the electrons. Okay, so there's our apple tree. So again, this is the plate, uh, even though it looks like an apple tree, and the apples are electrons, even though they don't look it, that's fine. And let's just say that you're hungry and you want an apple. And uh, I don't know, you, you, uh, you need to come up with some way of getting an apple off the apple tree. Let's assume you have permission. Um, there are a couple ways you might do it, right? You might get a, get a ladder or something and climb up there, or maybe you're gonna wait around for one to fall, but you know, you're hungry and you don't wanna, you don't have a ladder and you wanna do this. So why not try and, Shake the tree, right? Push on the trunk back and forth. So I, so I wanted to come up with something that actually uh, has some kind of a wave motion to it, right? So if you push back and forth on the tree, then you can imagine that this is like the wave pushing back and forth um, on the metal, so to speak. And maybe that will have an effect on the apple, right? That kind of makes sense. So there we go. We shake our tree. And what happens? Well, an apple falls down. Fantastic. But maybe, you know, if we 
push the tree with larger amplitudes. Now, in this case, it's going to show it as uh, faster, which is not quite what I wanted, but that's the best I could get. So if you so if you uh, push the push the tree with larger amplitudes, which is the same thing as a higher intensity in this case, then you're going to get more apples. At least that's kind of what the wave model would would suggest, right? If you've never actually pushed on an apple tree, then this might not make a lot of sense, but um, yeah, if you uh, <laughs> if you push on an apple tree with like like a lot back and forth, then you actually get um, more apples. You don't have to push faster necessarily. You just have to go back and forth a lot. Anyway, um, and the other thing is, you might imagine that you have to at least apply some kind of a minimum uh, amplitude uh, in order to get an apple. You know, if you if you like if you think about it, if you apply no amplitude, then you you'll be waiting around a long time. But if you apply um, and if you if you don't apply very much amplitude, then that might not be enough to get an apple out. So, so that's that's kind of the apple tree analogy. Um, it explains some things of what were observed, um, specifically this idea of amplitude and intensity. Um, that 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 kind of had, if you if you think back to what I was doing in the simulation, as I increased the the amplitude, right? If I or rather, if I increase the intensity of the light, then I did in fact get more photoelectrons. But there was something more to it, though. There was something more to it because, after all, I had I had the intensity maxed out at hundred, and then all of a sudden, if I change the color of the light, right, the frequency or the frequency, you can say it another way, um, then I would get fewer photoelectrons. The 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 um, the less the frequency of the, the lower the frequency of the of the light, the fewer photoelectrons I would get. And in fact, once I was in the red, I wasn't getting any photoelectrons. And that's and that's something that this wave model doesn't really capture. Okay. Um, so another thing that I didn't mention is that um, wave theory would predict that you know if you if you if you have uh, and it, this doesn't work very well with the apple tree analogy, but if you, uh, you know, whip the apple tree back and forth with these big swings, then um, wave theory would predict that, you know, as the apple flies off, uh, it will have more kinetic energy. Um, but that, so, but that, that actually doesn't happen, right? Regardless of, of, the, of the intensity of the light that you use, the uh, kinetic energy doesn't, of the photoelectrons doesn't change. So that so that prediction of wave theory turned out doesn't work. Um, instead, what was observed, and again, you can do this yourself if you if you play with the simulation. What was observed is that the maximum kinetic kinetic energy of the photoelectrons increases as you increase the frequency of the light, okay, or decrease the wavelength. Same difference. Um, and this was the thing I was getting at earlier. If the frequency of the light was too low, so that means like if you have red light, for example, then you're not going to have any photoelectrons. It doesn't matter how intense the light is. You could have the most intense red light. Now, actually, I should be a little careful here, but at least for, for, for practical purposes, you could have a very intense red light and shine it directly on the surface, and you still won't get any photoelectrons out. Okay, So it turns out that frequency is really key here. Perhaps even like even more so than intensity, right? You need to at least have a certain frequency, or nothing will happen. The other thing that the wave model, and this is a little subtle, but the other thing that the wave model might predict is that there might be a lag between when you start the when you shine the light on the surface and when the actual photoelectrons get emitted. But in actuality, there was no time lag. As soon as you shine the light on the on the uh, electrode, you get photoelectrons, right? It happens essentially instantaneously. So these were the observations. And it was up to Einstein, because who else but an Einstein would be able to uh, explain these observations. Now, Einstein actually wrote the paper um, that, would, that he would win, end up winning the Nobel Prize for uh, while he was working in a patent office, right? So he wasn't. Uh, he had gone to university and whatever, but he wasn't he wasn't working as um, as a professor or something like that. He was working in a, as a clerk in a patent office, and he was just doing this on the side, <clears throat> which was kind of nice, right? It's kind of nice if you're a theoretical physicist because 
Um, you don't need the uh, you don't necessarily need all the equipment that an experimentalist might do. So Einstein went back and and he basically revived this old model, right? Newton's model of the of the corpuscular model of light. Now a couple of things that Einstein did is he is he first of all he changed some of the language, and he called. In, in, he gave these this idea of a light particle a new name called a photon. Okay, so so whenever you hear the word photon, what that's really what's that what that's really indicating is that we're talking about light, but considering it as a particle. Right? It doesn't make sense to talk about uh, light as a wave and use the word photon um, in the same sentence. Right? That's they're kind of two different things. So. That was part of his genius is, first of all, thinking about light as a particle or as a photon, in, as, as I'll call it. And the other thing is, is describing that a photon has a discrete or quantized, as it came to be uh, called later, a quantized amount of energy. So each photon, if you can think about it, each photon of light has a certain set amount of energy. It's not like there's, it's not like if you're talking about kinetic energy, um, you know, you can throw a baseball and it will have like more or less depending on how fast you throw it. A light particle has a, has a has a discrete amount of energy and it's always the same depending on what the light's frequency is. So this was kind of the key and, and kind of the genius of Einstein that he realized that frequency was actually the most important characteristic here. Um, now, in order for the photoelectron effect to occur, the, the photon had to have a sufficient amount of energy to rip the electron away from the atom, right? And so what you would, the way uh, Einstein categorized this was to say that the, 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 pho the, the photon had to have more energy than the surface's work function. So for example, if we were taking something, if we were trying to remove an electron from sodium, as I did in the simulation, then the photon has to have more energy than the work function of sodium. And this work function thing, it's for those of you who have taken grade 12 chemistry, um, you've probably heard about something called uh, ionization energy, um, and it's basically the same kind of idea, okay? So the idea is, how, so that's, that's, the, that's the thing, right? Ionization energy and work function are very closely tied to one another. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't taken chemistry, it doesn't matter, but if you have taken chemistry, then you can hopefully link those two things in your mind. Um, the equation here is for the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectron, because again, for those of you who have taken chemistry, you know that electrons live in different levels of the, of the atom. And so depending on where the, uh, the, photoelectron was residing, was living before it was ejected, then it will have different amount of kinetic energy. But the maximum amount of kinetic energy is given by this equation. So uh, EPH, the left-hand side of the equation, is the kinetic energy of the photoelectron. And that's equal to HF. So H is this thing called Planck's constant. I'll talk more about that in a second. F is the frequency of the light in Hertz. And this phi, this circle with the, the line through it, that's the Greek letter phi, that's the work function of the metal. So that's how that's the minimum amount of energy that the um, that the photon needs to have. If it can't overcome that, it's like a barrier that you can't that you can't jump over. Okay, you need to have the, the photon needs to have at least that much energy, otherwise there's no photoelectron. Okay, so how does this play out with this apple tree analogy? Okay, so in this case, we're gonna, instead of shaking the tree, the tree trunk, right, and hoping that an apple will fall out, instead, in this case, we're gonna throw some stones at the tree. So the stones are going to be those photons. But the game is still the same. We're trying to hit an apple with a stone and hope that the apple will fall down and then we can eat it, okay? So if we throw the stone too slowly, well, then it's just going to kind of bounce off and we're not going to get an apple, right? The apple has actually some, you know, the stem of the apple has some strength. It's held onto the branch. So if we throw the stone too weakly, then um, the apple's going to stay there. It's not going to fall off and we're not going to get an apple. Well, that's no fun. 
Instead, if we throw this, if we throw the stone quickly, so this would represent a high energy photon, then all of a sudden the apple comes loose and flies off. Right? If you weren't just looking for one apple, if you want to have several apples, you need a lot of stones. And that's the idea of getting high intensity, right? High intensity in this in this analogy means throwing lots of stones. Maybe you get a bunch of your buddies and you all throw stones together. I don't know, who knows? Okay, so I want to look at a sample problem that actually uses that earlier equation. Um, and I also want to mention one thing that I forgot earlier, so hopefully I remember this time. So here's the sample problem. Find the minimum frequency of light required to eject photoelectrons from a metallic surface whose work function is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, so we're going to use this Einstein equation here, right? The photoelectron equation. Now, I have to mention that this first uh, term on the, on the right-hand side of the equation, HF, that's actually the energy in the photon, okay? So I mentioned how one photon has a very specific amount of energy. That's HF. The amount of energy in the photon is HF. I should have mentioned that earlier. Okay, so there you go. So the EPH, again, remember the EPH is actually the photoelectron. So maybe that was, that's not the best subscript. Maybe I should have used a PE. But anyway, this is going to be the energy of the photoelectron, right? Not the energy of the photon. The energy of the photon is just HF. So make that note for yourself, for those of you who are uh, watching at home. Okay. So if we want to find the minimum frequency, then we do a little bit of algebra to isolate it. We plug in our numbers. Now, again, the energy of the photoelectron if we're, if we're trying to find the minimum frequency, then that means that we're just going to have enough energy we're, to eject the photoelectron, but it won't have any kinetic energy. So don't ask me what that's going to look like. It's just going to be like a, the surface, and then the, and then the photoelectron is going to be sitting there on the surface, but without any kinetic energy to actually go anywhere, whatever. That would be a situation where you'd want an external electric field so that all you need to do is just have it you know, leave the surface, and then you could use the... Uh, electric field to push it to the other electrode. In any case, um, so the so the kinetic energy of the photoelectron is going to be zero, and then uh, we put in our numbers. So again, the work function seven point two times ten to the negative nineteen joules, and then divide by h, which is known as Planck's constant, and it's this really goofy constant here, uh, with you know the the word salad of units. Uh, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. Fun fact, it was also, it was a plot point in the most, in season three of uh, Stranger Things. So if you haven't seen that, you'll, if you have seen that, you'll know that I'm only taking the first four digits. There's actually many. It's, a, it's one of those uh, constants that, you know, people memorize like pi. Anyhow, um, so you plug that in your calculator and you get uh, the frequency of the light is 1.1 times 10 to the 15 hertz, which is quite high. In fact, this is in the petahertz regime. All right. What does that mean from a practical standpoint? Because I don't expect you to know, like, what is the frequency of, you know, any given color of light? Well, in fact, this is, uh, this is um, in the ultraviolet. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's basically the deal. For this, uh, for the homework for this lesson, I would like you to do these three uh, three questions: number nine, number eleven, and number thirteen. And when you do number eleven and thirteen, you're going to see that the um, that the that the numbers in there um, for the work function, uh, especially, are usually not given in joules. They're given in something called electron volts. Okay, and so an electron volt is very simply how much energy does it take to move one elementary charge through one volt. That's basically it. Um, so it's and so it's given by that that conversion at the bottom there. You can see. Um, yeah, if if any of you are paying close attention, you'll recognize that number as actually the elementary charge just with different units. Instead of uh, coulombs, it's actually with joules. And again, that just comes from the uh, from the definition. Uh, the other thing that I didn't have time to talk about today is the Compton effect, which goes back to our very, very early part of the course where we were talking about collisions and conservation of momentum. So the Compton effect was not was observed uh, in, was it the 30s, 1930s, 1920s, I forget now. But anyway, the Compton effect basically showed that, um, like it was quite conclusive actually, it showed that uh, photons have 
momentum, which is something that you know, might be might seem kind of weird. Um, so photons have momentum, and you can collide photons with, you know, what you might consider particles like electrons, for example. And there will actually be these recoil effects. Uh, so it's actually pretty interesting. And the Compton effect is actually more, I would argue that from a physicist perspective, the Compton effect is more important and is actually more better evidence that um, photons are actually particles or that light can be a particle. Um, and it turns out to be a really important feature of um, high energy physics. Read those, read those couple pages on the Compton effect. Um, again, it just basically goes back to the very beginning of the, of the course on uh, when we talked about elastic um, elastic collisions and uh, it's just applied to a different um, different set of circumstances but the physics is still all the same so anyway see you next time folks thanks for watching have a good one don't forget to like share and subscribe